nervous. <clears throat> My name is Sean Hudson. I'm uh, an embedded Linux architect for uh, Mentor Graphics. Um, I also represent Mentor as a member of the uh, Yocto Project Advisory Board and am a member of the Open Embedded Board as of a month or so ago. <coughs> so, uh, before I jump in here, the challenge for this presentation is that you know building an embedded Linux distribution from source is a pretty complex task. So um, the tools that drive that process are also pretty complex, and the Yocto project certainly is a, a fairly complex uh, set of tools. Um, I also want to take a moment and thank a lot of the people that. Uh, uh, that really, this is a complete ripoff from. The documentation on the, the Yocto project is some of the best that you'll find for an open source project. It's not perfect, um, but it is actually really, really good. Um, there's a lot of people that contribute to that, and we have uh, at least one full-time uh, doc, um, and I'm blanking on his name, but uh, Scott Reifenberg. Um, who does a tremendous job in, in helping to uh, transform engineering drivel into you know, something that's actually pretty useful. Um, other people that uh, I'm kind of leveraging their work is Chris Hallinan, uh, who also works at, uh, at Mentor Graphics, and then Kem, who a lot of you know from the Kem Raj, who works at Juniper, but has also been very, uh, very instrumental in the success of Open Embedded. Um, so all of that said, the complexity that, that goes into building an embedded distribution makes it impossible for me to cover uh, all the topics that might be related to the Octo project and using that to build one uh, in a 50 minute pre presentation. So I'm going to try and do a quick survey of some of the basics. Um, in some ways this is uh, turned into a little bit more introductory than I intended, uh, but we'll, we'll uh, kind of try and tune that um, based on what you guys uh, give me in terms of feedback. I ask that you go ahead and just raise your hand for questions and let me know if you have one, but uh, I may cover something if you if you jump in too quickly. So we'll try and strike that balance. Um, so initially, I'm going to give you just a very quick overview. Um, really, I'm going to use the, the quick start guide as a, as a framework that's going to allow us to explore a little bit more about uh, some of the pieces that are inside the Octo project. Um, I've done my best to make sure that I get all the way through to the end, but uh, these slides will be posted um, to the Linux Foundation at the end. Um, after I kind of take a look at some of the big pieces, I'm also going to take a look at a few of the tools that I have found uh, to be fairly handy uh, in, in finding um, pieces that I need to work with. Uh, and then I will try and, at the end, talk a little bit about some of the basic how-to pieces that we seem to get a lot of questions about. Um, again, I can't stress enough that the, the Yocto project uh, itself does have a great deal of documentation. I know you get a lot of RTFM from people, but um, realistically it's, it's worth your time. Uh, so in order, I'm going to go ahead and, as I said, do a quick overview, take a look at what the, the um, initial download gives you and what a build tree looks like. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the concepts, layers, recipes, DB appends and such, uh, highlight those tools, and then go to the how-to. And if we have enough time, uh, I'll try and at least save a little bit of time at the end for q and Unlike Kuhn, who uh, did like 15 minutes of slides and then opened it up for questions, I sort of took the other tack. I think that um, the level of work that, uh, in terms of slide preparation, I, I probably should have gone his way. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now this is sort of what I consider to be my vanity slide. Um, you may notice me sitting there in the middle. This is from ELCE um, Barcelona. This is the front page of the Octo project. Um, you'll notice the big tagline there. It's not an embedded distribution. It builds one for you, or it creates a custom one for you. Uh, and then in smaller print, the Yocto project is an open source collaboration, blah, blah, blah. OK, so put it, putting it a different way, um, the Yocto project tries to provide basic pieces for building an embedded Linux distribution. These pieces add little value for companies but are necessary to build an end product. Uh, in short, the project should allow developers to focus on the features that matter to their customers. And that's at all levels. So I, I think of four different tier, tiers generally. A platform builder who builds the basic distribution, an application developer who builds applications that fit into that distribution, 
and a custom, or their customer would then be an OEM that builds a final product, and their customer, of course, is the person that buys one. So those customers, again, can be internal and external. It's not a hard and fast rule. But again, the, fo the focus is you add little value to what you're doing if you're doing the same thing everybody else is. So by getting rid of some of the common pieces, you're trying to accelerate uh, what makes your product different. So I get this question uh, fairly frequently. I realized I didn't mute my phone. Okay, there we go. Um, you know, why not just use an existing distribution? Um, you know, you can use a Debian, you can use a Fedora. These are certainly valid choices, but you're losing a lot in terms of flexibility. You're very dependent on what's going on upstream, uh, and you're dependent on the cadence of the releases and the developers that are outside of your control. Um, building from source is going to give you a lot more flexibility and control of your embedded image. And that comes in regardless of whether or not you're using a reference distribution inside uh, the Octo project, which there are several. Uh, Angstrom and po uh, Pocky is the, the correct pronunciation, are two good examples. However, even those have spec uh, specific goals that you need to keep in mind. For instance, Angstrom is really focused on enabling hardware hobbyists to get access to their boards and, and move on. So it's a binary package feed, primarily. Pocky is really more focused in on validating the build system itself. So as a result, it tends to be a lot less stable. Um, there's also commercial ones. This is where I get to plug Mentor Embedded Linux, which I'm a, uh, the architect for. Um, our value add is that we're going to take uh, the Yocto project and add stability to it. So regardless of anything else, um, building from source is really going to help you enhance your security of your product. And that's, again, at all four of those tiers, um, or the three intermediates. Um, it's going to help you increase you know, the timeliness of your product. So when you have a specific issue or you need to address a specific feature, you can do it right there. Um, it allows you to greatly customize your image size. This has become less important uh, as time has gone on in early days of Embedded, obviously, uh, the image size drove a lot of decisions. These days, the footprints are staggering when you, when you think about it in terms of history. Uh, and licensing. Um, licensing is continuing to be a big focus uh, and a big problem for companies. There's, um, I would describe it as an allergy uh, for a lot of corporations to absorb GPLv3 into their code base. And so, Tools that help uh, make sure that that doesn't happen uh, are very, very useful. Yocto Project uh, incorporates those, and you can guarantee that that's correct by looking at the source. So it goes back to being able to build um, from source. So building your own distro allows you to support those, those different customers that I talked about, both internal and external, in a very uh, useful way. So that's all sort of the preface. Any questions? So in most organizations, you've got, well, hopefully most organizations, you've got somebody mo monitoring CVEs uh, and making sure that uh, as exploits are discovered um, that they're dealt with in your product. Uh, if you find an exploit in a binary package that you're getting from an outside source, you're then dependent on that outside source to provide you with the update that addresses that security fix. If, on the other hand, you have the source package, you get the fix, you can apply it yourself, and in most cases the patch is already available by the time the CVE is published. Um, or you can go and find and fix your own things from reports from customers, and maybe you're the one that's, that actually publishes that patch back out. Good question. Anybody else? All right. So, okay, this gets into more of the, lots of screenshots. Um, so the quick start, uh, the Yocto project, as I said, has some great documentation. Uh, I'm, my template on this was to take a, uh, a look at the, uh, the quick start guide that's out there, which is very much of a recipe, follow these instructions, and you'll end up with something. Uh, and try and pull it apart a little bit to, uh, to use that as a framework to explain some of the pieces uh, of the, the Yocto project. Um, so moving on. This is what your initial download will look like. When you, this is, if you, if you can tell from the, the name of the directory, um, Danny 8.0, which is 
I'm going to completely sidestep the whole versioning aspect of things. We can, you can ask me about that at the end. Um, this is what the, the basic download looks like if you extract it uh, into your local system. Um, there's several pieces that are worth looking at here. Obviously, BitBake at the top there is critical. That is the engine that drives the compilation process. It interprets the recipes, puts together all the metadata, and actually generates your image at the end. Um, so the documentation I've already talked about. And then you see these meta directories. And all of these meta directories are metadata. And they describe how to build things. I'll, get, I'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, you also see a nice, um, in my, my slide here, a nice color highlighted script there, which is your starting point. Then typical readme. And then the scripts is kind of the glue. So lots of layers that contain all this metadata. But we'll, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So let's go ahead and uh, run that script and see what happens. So it, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff on the screen here. Essentially what this boils down to is it's going to create a directory that has two files in it. Um, you'll notice also down there at the bottom that it gives you a set of targets. So BitBake is actually um, built around targets. Um, the definition of a target is, is generally uh, an image, but it's somewhat more flexible than that. So here you see uh, a set of stock images that the Yocto project is uh, going to provide. A good starting point would be a, a core image minimal, um, which is just that, a minimal image. Is there any command to enumerate the targets that are available within the um, Not that I know of, although that's a, that's a good question. Usually I just look. Um, in the, the metadata directories, but that's a, that's a useful. There, there are some kind of find-ish, grab-ish type things you can use on the meta directories to get a list of like your possible images based on like the DB files. Right, and that's, that's exactly what I do. But there isn't, as far as I know, a good wrapper for that, although it's, it would be fairly trivial to, to write a script to do that. We just, this is one of those things that would be useful uh, to do. Hob uh, essentially gives you a, a look at that um, because, uh, you know, the difference between the command line, which is my focus here, versus a GUI is, of course, one emits data and the other one is, is definitely a query response kind of a, kind of a format. Um, so, yeah, the GUI actually highlights um, images much, much more easily um, than the command line. Um, but, you know, essentially this is just a quick run. It doesn't really do that much, though. When you look at it, it's creating, like I said, two files. <laughs> so this, if you look closely, um, you know, this is the, the pokey directory. Below that, it's now created a build directory. Inside that build directory, there's one subdirectory and then two files. And that's all that that script is really doing, except that it's also setting an environment variable. Actually, I think it's two. And updating your path to point to some of the pieces that are inside this tree. For the most part, you don't have to worry about it. Um, it doesn't really affect you initially. Um, understanding what this is doing later on can help uh, if you, for instance, need to pass variables from your environment into the build system. Uh, knowing that this script helps control that process, then you can take a look at that and tailor it to your, to your own specific needs. So if you run it a second time, it detects the fact that the directory by default is already there. I didn't talk about the fact that there's an argument you can give to this, which will be the directory that it, name that it will create. By default, it's creating a build directory. Um, you can call it whatever you want, and it will essentially do the same thing. So in the second run, all this is really doing is just setting the environment up for you. So again, the path is set up. There's something called the BB Extra White. I think that's the full name of it. Um, that passes um, uh, environment variables in. So there's been no change to the tree at this point. Let's go ahead and run a build. And this is just a snapshot. Um, I actually ran a Sato build. And I, I meant to, to highlight the, uh, I'm sorry, let's, let's see right here. So core image minimal is just a very minimal build. Core image Sato is an example UI based off of, I think it's the GNOME UI. Um, so it's an extremely, um, extremely useful package to build. It touches a lot of, or ex a good image to build because it touches a lot of different packages, a lot of different recipes. Um, I don't generally use most of the other targets, um, but 
if you need to, they're, they're there for reference. So running a build, and here's where I inject a little humor. Um, you know, an initial build is dependent on, you know, two things here. It's dependent on, you know, the speed of your machine and the speed of your network connection. Uh, if you download, um, you can pre-download a, a large chunk of source, and that's one of the things that, um, that Mentor Embedded Linux or Mel uh, kind of preloads you for. Um, but it can typically take between one and two hours. It's actually very common for a, for a Sato build. Um, this beast that I have here that I'm presenting with um, is a, a work station or work um, baby server, really. Uh, and it takes, uh, I think, about 88 minutes or so for an initial Sato build. Um, so be prepared the first time it takes a substantial amount of time. Good news is that subsequent times take a lot less. So let's take, a, let's take another look then now at what our tree looks like now. You're going to notice, and, and I debated with myself about hiding this, but um, there's two links there. And they're pointing off to another location on my drive. Um, this is an optimization that I've done. Uh, and I, I felt that it was useful enough to, to go ahead and show. Um, this is the, the, what the directory looks like after the build is complete. You'll notice that really there's only um, three new directories actually created. Downloads, sstate cache, and temp. The downloads is where all of your source packages that BitBake has gone out and acquired from the, from the network um, are stored. Um, if they're there, the next time it runs, it will use them. Uh, it also does um, what's called a shared state. So as it compiles packages, it does a hashing algorithm that tries to identify when there's been changes. It's actually very robust at this point. Uh, it was introduced in uh, 1.3, right? So 1.3? Yeah. And uh, it, it's matured actually quite rapidly. So um, what I've done here by soft linking is I've made sure that this is shared. Um, if by default, the behavior is to create this as a separate directory. That makes it nice and self-contained, but especially for something like source downloads, um, it doesn't make sense. This is one way to do it. There's other ways to actually put in... On the local.com Yeah. So the, the local... The, I wasn't even going to get into the details on local.com so much. But um, there's ways to configure this behavior without doing this. Um, I just have a nice little script that did this for me um, as an automation uh, for myself. And then the temp directory. And this is the build output. That's where everything goes that um, uh, isn't a source cache or, or shared state. So let's take a look in there. Did I yeah. hear? This is for me locally. Um, you can the but so the shared state is actually reusable. So um, when you go through, the the no, no, no. Okay, so what? Maybe I shouldn't have shown the soft link. Um, this is pointing to a separate directory uh, in my machine. So this is shared amongst my machine. There's actually different levels of sharing that you can do. Uh, for instance, you can publish them so that all machines on the network can see that. That involves a little bit more uh, tweaking of your local.conf. Um, that's inside that conf directory that I, I showed a little while back, but I, I don't want to go that far back. Um, so uh, you know, the point here is that when I create a new build structure, uh, I don't want it to always have to go and download the same BusyBox source file that it did last time. And I don't want it to have to rebuild it if it's the same configuration. So if I'm building the exact same configuration um, in a new build structure, uh, then the shared state is reusable. And so it's also helpful in team. It, it's more useful at, at a team level. This is just because my personal machine, uh, how I manage it here. But if you've got a whole bunch of people um, then it's, it's most useful there. And in fact, again, that's one of those things that, you know, we do. Uh, it, it does. And, and I'll look at it a little bit more. But shared state is actually pulled in and expanded uh, as part of that process. So it's checked. Okay? Uh, we can come back to that. So, you know, I showed you the, the temp directory here at the top level. I just showed you two levels deep. There's a whole mess of stuff here. And... Uh, you know, the thing that kind of look at 
is there's a couple of directories in here I wanted to look at real quickly. Build stats is a useful um, build stat information, as it would as it would seem to imply. Not going to go into any more detail on that, but there's some useful information there for later on after you've been running builds. Deploy is one that you know is important to know because this is where your actual images go to. So keep that in mind if you're hunting around trying to figure out <clears throat> where did my root file system actually end up, where did my kernel image end up, here. It's underneath there. Was there another question? No? Okay. Um, package data I found pretty useful um, because it describes a whole lot of information about the packages. But work is really where the action is. This is where most of the, the stuff that you would probably be looking at is going to be. Um, this is where source archives get extracted to. This is where shared state actually gets extracted to. Um, this is where logs get generated and also where the scripts that actually um, get run uh, get put. So this is kind of dialing down, you know, what's, so what's in the work directory. And you'll notice that these are separated uh, now by target. So you're looking at an all Pocky Linux, an I50, uh, I586, uh, QEMU x86, and so on. So some of these are targeted towards the, the native host environment. Those tools um, are generally going to be in x86, 64 Linux, since this is a 64-bit machine. Uh, and then the other ones are, um, as they would indicate, m more for a specific architecture. So how far down do I need to go to find something useful? Uh, if you look up there at the top, um, you're now dialed down about five, six directories, and inside that directory is where um, stuff is really going on. Now, this one is for BusyBox. Uh, there's some useful information that you can extract just from looking at this, that it's BusyBox version 1.20.2. Uh, R2 is actually something related to the version of the recipe that was used to build it. And inside this directory, you're going to see BusyBox 1.20.2, uh, and that is where the source archive is extracted to. Um, there's deploy RPMs, image, and so on. The packages split is, I find, a pretty interesting um, because you can actually see how your packages get spread out uh, into installable pieces. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, and the temp directory, uh, again, is of interest because now that's where the logs go, that's where um, the run scripts go. So I'm flying through this. Are there any other questions before? Mike. How are the sources packaged? Okay, so this is inbound um, versus outbound. The, the packaging of the source archive coming in is going to depend on whatever the upstream is providing. So TARD, GZ is, is fairly common. Um, you can have other pieces in here, like there, if it's a Git recipe, then it'll pull straight from there. Um, outbound, you have choices of what package format you want to use. The default for Pocky and for the Yocto project is RPM, um, which is a little different from Open Embedded, which uses the O package format. Um, but it, it's it's tunable. You can you can choose. Can you use dev and O package for both available also along with So if I wanted to modify. That's a good question. Um, it's kind of jumping ahead, but it's a good time to talk about it since we're here. There's different workflow models. Um, the thing about this directory is that the, the source is going to be get modified um, if, for instance, the revision changes. Um, this directory gets left behind, and then what gets built is the next, the next revision up. So what you can do, and many people do, uh, is build um, repeatedly out of this directory, get their, get their patches where they like them, and then commit them as patches to another recipe. Uh, and then in the process of doing that, they've now captured their changes. Um, there's a bunch of different workflows. Um, that's one. Uh, there's other workflows that involve actually um, having it track uh, the, uh, a source repository like Git. Uh, it requires that the repository has um, a set of uh, a set of canonical revisions that's trackable. So Git works, Subversion works, Bazaar I think works. Um, you know, th I think there's a few of them out there that are a little wacky that, that don't quite work for that. So it depends on what you want to do. This is one of those areas that, in my opinion, is poorly addressed today. Um, 
and we talked actually a little bit about this um, uh, earlier. What, this is part of the, the area that is in the cycle where, okay, I've, great, I've got my platform build. The application builder wants to come in and, and uh, do their work. Um, one mechanism that you can do, and this is nowhere in this presentation, is build an SDK. An SDK you then give to them. They work against that. They get their source code where they want it, and then they submit it back to the platform builder. The platform builder then writes the recipe and integrates it back in. Yeah, so for kernel work, there's actually sort of a, even a, a different workflow, and I don't touch the kernel to save my life. When go, to the, go to the uh, tutorials. That one's a pretty complex yeah. animal. Um, most, I think most kernel developers work with a git tree, get it, get it to where they're happy with it, um, and then worry about integrating it back in. Um, so this is how far down you need to, oh, okay. It is. It is by default. So um, you can use an external pre-built uh, tool chain if you want. Um, I didn't cover that in this just for, because of time. Um, we sell one, <laughs> so feel free. Um, but uh, yeah, the tool chain by default is actually built uh, when, when you download the initial one. Okay, so that, that's actually probably a deeper question than I want to get into right now. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll get with you <coughs> after. Um, I will show you, however, in this slide, a little bit about where you can find some of it. So um, one of the most useful, uh, I think, learning tools and, and useful features of BitBake initially is dumping the environment. So this kind of gives you a, an idea of what's going to happen um, when you for instance, do a bit bake for, busy for BusyBox. Um, the dash E just dumps it to standard out. You probably want to capture that someplace. It essentially gives you the environment that BitBake is going to run the build in. Uh, and the run script, um, which is located deeper down, is actually your, the answer to your question, Michael. So um, I find this very useful, for instance, instead of CDing down into the directory structure and trying to find, okay, which directory was it? Was it, uh, was it under all pokey or was it under x86, 64, or, or where was this actually located? And what you can do is you can do a bit bake uh, of the target and then grep, grep for source. Um, I hate to, this to be magic, but essentially source is the source directory. And that will give you a fully decorated source directory that gets you to where you want to look. Um, there's a lot of variables like that, uh, and I th have an example recipe that uh, I, I will try and point out how some of these are generated. But uh, for the most part, this is just uh, probably the best way to look at it. Uh, and then this is the working directory. Um, same, similar type of thing. In fact, they're going to be generally from the, the same uh, root. Um, so these are three different ways that you can use it. Uh, it's very instructive, I found it very instructive, to just do a dump of one of the simpler recipes using bitbake minus E, and then kind of look through the variables that are set and what they're set to. Uh, it helped me a lot with the taxonomy of the tree and the way that pieces were being laid out. Uh, it begins to make a little bit more sense. You'll, s you'll get a feel for what things get inherited uh, by default, um, and I will touch on that again. How are we doing? Whoa. Okay, I got to speed up. <laughs> okay, so what are layers then? The big layers are just basically a way to collect different recipes together. Um, if you do a good job of creating modular recipes, then it makes your reuse and your maintenance a lot easier going forward. Um, think, I think of it in terms of the, the typical layer cake. Um, it's just one of those things that... It's, it's a way to aggregate pieces together. This is an example of one of the layers that is included with the Yocto project by default. This is the meta Yocto BSP layer. You'll notice that there's a uh, conf directory and underneath that, and since this is a BSP one, there's a machine directory. I've taken the files out because otherwise it was too big. I don't know if you guys can see that. Is it too small? Does that work? So you'll notice that there's also a standard definition applied here, um, recipes-bsp-core, and so on. Below those are the names of um, the, the recipes that are going to be built, so also state, and then there's 
again, dialing down some more, um, more information there. Um, just kind of trying to give you a feel for how these things are laid out. All these recipes are the metadata. So if the layer is just a collection of recipes, then you know, how do we explore them? Uh, given the number of layers uh, and the number of recipes that can go into a build, this is a pretty non-trivial task. So a useful way to, to try and track these down is to use a tool called BitBake Layers. Um, not everybody uses this one. It's unfortunately not as, I, I just don't know why people don't use it more, but th these are the options that you have. Um, it's extremely useful to understand, and I didn't get a good screenshot of this. Uh, if I have time, I'll, which I don't think I will, uh, I'll show, you, um, show it to you live. It'll show you the layers and show you the priority that they're going to be applied. Um, it will also allow you to take a look at um, the recipes uh, that are available from uh, the entire collection of metadata at one point in time. I find that extremely useful when I'm trying to track down uh, a specific uh, piece of functionality, um, a specific um, recipe. Um, so if we have all these layers, then they're made of recipes, then what are these recipes? Well, this is just an example. This one happens to be from the, the Pocky Tiny. Um, that's the init one. Uh, there's a lot of fields in here. Um, the best advice I can give you is when you start writing recipes, Take a template, right from the template. There's a skeleton function out there that will help you out. Um, it's not actually, again, as widely used as it probably should be. Um, there's some key things to take a look at here. Um, the license is, is something that you're going to fail QA checks if you're not providing good information in. Uh, this is the license of the source package that you're going to build versus the recipe. So um, that's apparently something that a lot of people get a little confused initially about. Um, the PR stands for package revision. Unfortunately, um, packages, recipes, and um, source packages are sort of munged together. There's a definitional problem there that uh, people get a little bit hung up on. Um, so one of the things I can recommend, in fact, I think I cover it, is uh, it's taking a look. There's a blog from Chris Allen and on the mentor page that helps talk about some of this terminology and clear things up for people. One of the other issues here, the, one of the most important things to look at here is that the source URI, this defines where um, you're going to get your source. In this case, it's trivial. Um, these are all locally attached um, inside the, the actual recipe subdirectory. Um, so there's a file named init and then there's an RC local sample. Uh, it then blank, blanks out some of these tasks, which are do configure, do compile, and do install. These are things that are just, if you write a basic recipe, will happen by default. Um, in this case, this is such a trivial recipe that it was important to override those defaults because the configure didn't really make sense for this. It's essentially copying in uh, an init file. Uh, last thing on here is a files uh, directive. This is actually what defines um, the files that go into uh, binary packages that are what end up in your root file system. And I'll touch on that. And so then the question is, what the heck are packages? And this is where we talk a lot about um, some of the, uh, the distinctions here. So if a recipe is the directions that BitBake uses to take a source or a set of source and output something, um, then a package is what that is, that's what that something is. And this can be a binary package, this can be a set of headers, this can be a set of documentation. In the case of the previous example, it really was just copying one file that was a standard file into the root file system. So one thing to keep in mind, and this one hangs up a lot of people initially, the name of a package is not necessarily the same as a recipe. Um, they are usually related somehow, <laughs> but there's special cases where they're not alike. Um, so distinguish between a source package, which is an archive you bring in, um, the recipe name, uh, and then the package that gets put into the root file system. It's important to know multiple packages 
can and do, in almost all cases, come from the same recipe. So I talked a little bit about uh, a binary package. That's the actual compiled output. The standard four are a binary output, a dev output, a debug output, and a doc. And those just go and collect files with a standard uh, wildcard search in the tree and put them into um, the package format that you chose, either RPM or, or IPackage. Um, this is controlled by the files variable. Um, so if you wanted to change, the, for instance, the way files went into the dev package, you would modify, in this case, the files underscore pn, that's the default binary package there. Uh, you, would underscore f you would modify files underscore, say, dev, and then add in an additional wildcard uh, example. Now this is a little munged because I didn't get all my line breaks correct here. There's actually two files in that files pn there. This is critically important. When you go to add something to an image, you need to add in the package, not the recipe. Uh, so for instance, if you want to add in the dev, then you would generally give it that package name and then the, the underscore de or dash dev. Um, this is, again, something just pay attention to. When you first start doing it, it, it seems a little counterintuitive. Um, but as you do it a little bit, you'll, you'll figure out it's, it's really not that bad. It just takes a fair amount to explain. So what then is a BB append? Well, the recipes are, and I completely forgot to say that, a recipe is actually captured in a .bb file, stands for bitbake. A BB append file is a way to add customizations without completely throwing away the old recipe. Um, this is used with layers. And in particular, this is used to allow for customization that can track against an upstream. So if you have a specific patch you want to apply, but you want to continue to track an upstream package, this is the way to do it. Um, so now you can see how these pieces interact. Um, one thing to, uh, to keep in mind is that this is the core of the reason why you want to be careful about how you segregate your layers. Uh, more often than not, the first thing you're going to do when you're building your own distro is go and create your own layer. Uh, for your distro or for your hardware. And a lot of times those are very good to separate a, one from the other so that you can, again, uh, modify them uh, somewhat independent of each other. Uh, BB appends, as the name implies, are really additive. They add something on top of or to uh, an existing recipe. Unfortunately, um, subtractive operations are <laughs> uh, Difficult, technically, in fact, to the point where some operators will probably never exist. Um, it's been a, a popular question. We got it yesterday. Um, so, you know, when you get to a point where you really want to pull something out, more often than not, what you're going to end up doing is overriding the recipe entirely. That means that you're no longer tracking upstream, so there's a little bit more of a maintenance cost there, but that's sort of the, the state of the art as of right now. Okay, so before I kind of close on a little bit, um, I wanted to introduce something. This is Chris Larson works at uh, Mentor <coughs> Graphics. He's been uh, he was one of the core uh, developers for Open Embedded for many years and contributes heavily to Bitbake. He's been working on a new tool called BB. Um, this is based off of uh, I can't remember what the actual model is, but it's a command line driven uh, model where you have a bunch of subcommands. I think it's called subcommand. Um, it's still kind of alpha, but this is an extremely useful tool. Um, uh, I would suggest taking a look at this because it gives you the ability to kind of track down dependencies. One of the more common questions that we see is, you know, what is bringing something into my build? Why is it that this, is a, this particular file is showing up? Um, or why is this package showing up? It's difficult to track a specific file to uh, a particular package as it stands right now. That's one of our biggest asks. But um, certainly at the package level, this is something that will allow you to track dependencies. I kind of flew through that recipe that I threw up there. Um, one of the things that you're going to document very carefully in that recipe is what it depends on for build and what it depends on for run. Uh, those are two very important pieces that you need to get right or else it's not going to build correctly or after it's built correctly, it won't run correctly. Um, so 
those depends and R depends are tracked by the BB tool um, to show you. And I can't believe I didn't put any of this here. So the subcommands for BB are show um, the bitbake metadata, show depends, show provides, um, show what depends, what provides, and what um, runtime provides. Um, so the, I don't think I have a good example for you, but there's something that uh, afterwards I can certainly show a couple of you. Uh, it's very, very useful to be able to help you track down where things are coming from in your final image. Tim? Can, can you get the same information from the package graph from the existing it, You can. It's just this one is a, is a better query tool. The package graph, um, so there's a bitbake minus G, and I debated putting that one in here, and I actually didn't, uh, that will generate a dependency graph. You can use a, a, a visualization to, to actually view it. But what I found is that when you get anything more than a fairly trivial recipe, um, it, it gets somewhat problematic to see uh, what that is because the graph isn't big enough. Now, if you had a projection wall like this, then you could track it, then maybe. Um, so this one is nice because it does accept um, some wild cards like BitBake Layers does. Uh, and it, it just, it, it's an evolving tool um, that I think is going to be very useful for people to be able to kind of track things down. The intent is to ad eventually add in the ability to isolate a file out of the root file system and say, where did this silly thing come from? And if I don't want it, then you know where to go and modify that. OK. We're running close on time, I think. But um, It is not on project.org. I didn't put the URL up, did I? It's on GitHub. Look under Kurgoth, uh, which is Chris Larson's handle, um, uh, BB. Uh, I'll, I can give you guys that URL uh, afterwards. Um, uh, K-E-R-G-O-T-H. So it's github.com slash Kurgoth slash BB should get you there. OK. so. We're kind of winding down. Um, I was trying to, sorry about that. I was trying to uh, show something of a useful example. I didn't put everything in here that I meant to. This is an example of trying to track down BusyBox. I, I like BusyBox because everybody knows it. Um, I use BitBake layers to show the recipes that were available in my metadata. Um, you'll notice that I'm sitting in the build directory. Uh, that's how it knows what metadata to take a look at. Um, and you can pass in uh, a wild card. So uh, if you look at it, busy splat there, uh, it's going to, first of all, give me a warning because I'm using 12.04.2, which I think was 0.1, I think 1204.1 was supported as of um, uh, Pocky Danny, but um, that's, it, it works. Um, you see that it actually parses the recipes. So BitBait goes through initially and it actually builds all of the, um, the, the metadata into a database that it can then query and take a look at. And you notice that it says that there's available recipes, and it's G in meta, and it's BusyBox 1.20.2. For those who are paying attention, that's the example that I, I showed you before. That work directory, it corresponds to this version. Um, so OK, that's great. Uh, that tells me that it exists. It tells me a little bit of information about where I can find it. But what about where the output went? And so you'll notice that the next line down, I did that environment command that I showed you already. And I did a grep for the source. And now I can actually figure out, OK, look, here's that directory that the output actually is, or this is the source one, that the source is coming from. So when it got extracted, it got extracted into uh, this subdirectory, which is that horribly long path there the, after the S. Uh, and then the work directory, you'll notice, is basically one directory up from that. So all of that information is then collected in that temp build, or, or build temp work um, happens to be in the i586 Pocky Linux uh, BusyBox directory. So that's where, you, if you want to look at and work with the BusyBox recipe, that's where you would go look. So when you're tweaking for your distro, if you decide, for instance, that you want to play a little bit with BusyBox and reduce down uh, some of the pieces that BusyBox provides uh, for size or anything else, this is one of the places that you would go and look. So how do I add something into my image that didn't exist? This is a little tongue-in-cheek, but it's really actually not as tongue-in-cheek as, as you might think. Um, the first thing you got to do is develop whatever your new application is. If that's, I call it application, but it could apply to just about any module in the system, kernel or otherwise. Um, 
there's a lot of workflows. This is, goes to, to your question earlier. You can do that in the temporary directory. You can do that as a completely different um, you know, source repository, manually populated in. Um, I've personally used quite successfully uh, in a local extraction of the root file system, NFS mounted to my target, and then I can poke um, my, my binary in directly, and when I'm happy with it, then I commit it to source control and update my recipe. Um, it just, it's, it's kind of a chicken and an egg problem then. Uh, if you already have your platform build running, then great. Now you have a way to kind of poke things in. You can either have an SDK or you can build, like I said, with a root file system using NFS. Um, but that sort of presupposes that you already have that. Well, if you don't start with that, then you've got to build that first. Um, so it, it really it depends on what your workflow is. For application developers, if they are wanting to just get started, honestly, I would tell them start working against their host first. Uh, until the platform, can, the platform builders at that bottom layer of those four can provide them with an SDK or with just a platform build that's turnkey for them. Once you've got your application, um, you can create the recipe. I showed you that sample. Use the templates that are provided. There is a, um, there is a, uh, a, a skeleton script out there. I would like to point out, though, that one of the things that's really cool about this project is the number of people and active developers that are willing to answer questions. We've got a couple of them in the room. You happen to be sitting in the front, so I'm going to pick on you, Saul. Um, these guys are sort of live and breathe and don't seem to do anything else outside of IRC. So if you have a question, ask it on IRC. <laughs> if for some reason you can't get an answer, try the mailing list. There's, there's actually sort of a stupid amount of email that goes on the mailing list, but there's also a lot of really good uh, answers to questions and the like. So take a look at the skeleton script. Once you've done that, add that recipe to your layer. Um, again, I, I would suggest taking a look at some of the recommendations in the development manual and the reference manual as to how to partition these, but a general rule of thumb is have one for your BSP uh, and one for your applications, um, or if you have to put another one in for distro. Um, then add that into the image. And I think I actually show as the next one, how do I add that? So in order to add it into the image, um, you inherit from a specific image. There's, again, multiple ways. One of the cool things about it and one of the worst things about it is you can do just about anything that you want in about six different ways. And there's enough rope to hang yourself. And there's enough rope to hang yourself and there's some subtle differences. Now, hopefully I'm not scaring you with that. The point is if you get a workflow that works for you, stick with it unless you have a reason to change. Identify one that seems to match and, and move forward. Um, so this one is one that works for me. I inherit from an image, and then I add um, whatever the package, again, package, not recipe, that I want to add to the image to this image install variable. I am just about out of time. So this is how to actually add files, um, packages, and into uh, to a specific recipe. So there's those four default ones. Uh, this assumes that you have a working recipe. Um, add the package names. You can see that in that um, second bullet. And then for each of those package names, you can add a set of files. And you can see that there's a, um, there's a wildcard specification there. The implication here is everything under foo files will be created. Uh, it's a regex expression, so it'll match um, whatever. I think I'm not going to have time for a lot of questions, especially not for me, Dave. Um, <laughs> OK, so uh, I, a few final thoughts. Um, most of these are common sense. I'm just going to run through them real quick. Building a distribution from scratch is actually kind of a daunting task. The good news is that the Octo project gives you a tremendous running start. I would really strongly suggest that you take something that's existing first, so a BSP. The semis that are on board with the Octo project are starting to adopt it more and more. Intel, Freescale uh, is also providing some good ones. TI is providing some good ones. This gives you a great place to start from and then you're not starting at zero. So again, it goes back to that whole, don't work a whole lot on the stuff that doesn't add value for your customer. Um, get comfortable with the process. Dip your toes in. Um, make sure that you understand the roles and the workflows in your organization. That's very important because you can try and mismatch. Um, you can try and force something that isn't going to work. Um, play around and explore uh, using that bitbake-e command. Uh, is extremely useful, like I said, to kind of understand the way pieces play together. 
These tools are not perfect. No tool is. Uh, there's actually some pretty significant gaps, um, but that's where we can use a lot of help. And honestly, one of the places that I think we really could use the most help, and I'm looking at you, Tim, is from the, that, f that third layer, from the guys who are trying to build a product to give to a customer. Because we have a lot of OS vendors, I represent one, and, and silicon guys on the, the Yocto project, but not a whole lot of people that represent um, uh, companies that are really building uh, a product to give to an outside customer. Okay, so that's all I have. I think I'm pretty much out of time, but we maybe have time for, say, two